Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Happy to have you here with me, as always. My guest today is Karen Abbott. She is the New York Times bestselling author of Sin in the Second City, one of my all-time favorites, American Rose, and most recently, Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy. And I interviewed her about that particular book about three years ago or so, for those of you who remember. Her new book, The Ghosts of Eden Park, is an indie next pick, an Amazon best book of August, and a top fall history title for Publishers Weekly, which, in its starred review, called it a real-life page-turner that will appeal to fans of Eric Larson. Thank you for coming on again. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. So how long have you been working on this book? Well, I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, You know, I actually wrote, was thinking about this book even when I was working on Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy. Um, And that's partly because I I got the idea for this book from the TV show Boardwalk Empire, um, which probably many of your listeners know that uh, was a TV show on HBO that ran for five seasons. Um, And it was this brilliant show. It perfectly captured the dawn of the 1920s and how bootleggers were just beginning to circumvent prohibition laws and nobody had yet heard of Al Capone. And there was this minor character named George Remus. And he was really odd and slightly menacing. And he spoke of himself in the third person. um, And he stole every scene he was in. And I wondered if he was a real character, and indeed he was. He was an actual person. Um, The actual person also (laughs) spoke of himself in the third person and said things like, uh, this is going to be a hell of a Christmas for Remus, and uh, so many people want to kill Remus. Oh, my favorite quote of George Remus, the real person, was, Remus's brain exploded. Um, And you would have to read the book to decide for yourself whether or not a brain explosion actually occurred. (laughs) So, George Remus, such a a fascinating character. He was called King of the Bootleggers. Was that a name bestowed upon him or one he gave to himself? Um, I think it was a combination of both. Uh, Remus was um, relentlessly self-promoting and relentlessly reinventing himself. And he was indeed King of the Bootleggers. Um, This is somebody who... Uh, was a German immigrant who rose from poverty to eventually own, actually only after one year in the business, 35% of all the alcohol in the United States. Um, and newspapers at the time were comparing him to Rockefeller and to Vanderbilt and other, you know, captains of industry. Um, and he, he, he got that moniker in the newspapers and he, I think, wore it proudly. I never read any quotes by him saying that he was king of the bootleggers, but I, I think he embraced it and quite enjoyed that moniker. So his entrance into bootlegging parallels with the beginning of Prohibition. Exactly. Um, So he was a lawyer in Chicago, um, and he started getting clients who had a new type of violation. Um, They were breaking the laws against Prohibition. And Remus looked at his client's base, figured they weren't very smart, and that he himself, who was quite brilliant, actually had a chance to clean up. And he started scouring um, prohibition, the regulations and the law, the Volstead Act, and he found a loophole that he could exploit, which basically said that you could um, distribute alcohol for uh, medicinal purposes. Um, And to that end, Remus quit his law practice, moved from Chicago to Cincinnati because uh, 80 percent of the country's uh, pre-prohibition bonded whiskey was in a 300 mile radius of Cincinnati. And he bought up those distilleries, he bought drug companies, and then he got withdrawal permits so that he could, through the guise of these fake drug companies um, for medicinal purposes, um, withdraw the whiskey from his warehouses. And the most brilliant part of this plan, though, was he also organized a truck company where his own employees would start carrying this alcohol uh, for the curative medicinal market, ostensibly. And yet... Other people he paid went and then hijacked these trucks, thereby diverting all of that curative legal whiskey, putting it onto the illegal market. So he was basically robbing Remus to pay Remus, and he called this enterprise the circle. Um, And it was quite brilliant. Nobody else was doing it, um, especially not at this scale. And uh, he, within a year, by 1921, um, after a year in business, uh, owned 35% of all the liquor in the United States. 
He went from an attorney salary to a multimillionaire, <laughs> basically overnight. Just astounding. Exactly. Um, his uh, estimates of his wealth uh, fluctuate wildly, but just to give you a wide range, um, between $20 million and $40 million. And that's not adjusted for inflation. That's in 1921 money. So I'd love it if you could talk about George Remus more. Uh, what he looked like, his personality, his background. Uh, Remus, I have to say, was one of the most bizarre, interesting, and brazenly outlandish characters I've ever come across in history, which is saying a lot. (laughs) I sort of specialize in outlandish and bizarre characters, but um, Remus takes the cake. Um, I I spent about um, four months going through this transcript, um, which gave me very intimate details and insights into Remus's life and personality. Um, just to give you a few bizarre examples, um, he did not like to wear underwear, um, which in the 1920s apparently was a great cause for concern. It was the sign of an unsound mind. Uh, he was very controlling. He did not like anyone um, telling him what to do. He was uh, very athletic despite his stature. He was a short guy. He was stout. But he was very quick and swift, and he often boasted about his um, swimming prowess. He had been a competitive swimmer in in, uh, Chicago. He was very quick to anger. Um, He had no problems with physical confrontation. Uh, One of the incidents I learned was about um, how a a man uh, had done some business dealings with his second wife, Imogene, um, and he followed this man to Indiana and ended up nearly beating him to death with a cane. Um, And he was also, uh, you know, sort of sentimental and and possessive and um, wrote these very unhinged letters to his wife, especially when she was uh, beginning her affair with the prohibition agent Frank Dodge, um, Franklin Dodge, who uh, was, of course, the person who put Remus into jail. He's got kind of an Al Capone, Mickey Cohen kind of build. Yeah, he absolutely does. But really interesting about Remus was that he, you know, Al Capone built his empire on um, systematic violence. And Remus was actually a brilliant guy. He was widely read. He was a voracious reader. He collected books. He was interested in art. He could converse um, with great intellect upon a various, uh, various subjects. Um, and he had social aspirations. This is somebody who wanted to belong to society. Um, he wanted to sort of transcend his poor um, upbringing as a, as a German immigrant and become um, friendly and, and on the same level with people like uh, William Howard Taft, the Taft family, the Sittons, um, and other prominent families in Cincinnati. And he, he to that end, through these very lavish parties, um, there's a legendary party uh, on New Year's Eve of 1921 in which he invited all of Cincinnati's high society. None of them came to Remus's great disappointment. But it was it was an uh, outlandish party. He lit guest cigars with $100 bills. Um, he gave every woman at the party a brand new car. Uh, he slipped $1,000 bills under his guest dinner plates. And it's, it's rumored that this is one of the uh, reasons why F. Scott Fitzgerald might have based Jay Gatsby on George Remus, um, these, these really lavish parties that he threw. So he would end up being married twice and a daughter named Romola with his first wife, whom he would divorce before making his fortune, right? Yes, uh, they divorced when he was a lawyer um, in Chicago, and he actually met his second wife while he was practicing law. She was a quote-unquote dust girl in his office, uh, uh, so a cleaning person in his office, um, and she told him about the terrible divorce that she was enduring with her own husband, um, who was philandering and, and sort of running around and not paying child support. And um, Remus also was mentioning the problems he was having with his first wife, Lillian. So they sort of bonded over that, and Remus offered to pay um, to take care of her divorce uh, gratis, so it you know didn't have to pay. She also had to stop, could stop paying rent on her apartment in Evanston. He decided to pay all of her bills. He gave her an allowance. He moved in with her, uh, and they became a couple fairly quickly. And I think that. Um, Remus was attracted to Imogene's sort of sense of glamour, and she also had the same social aspirations as he did. And um, I think uh, Imogene was smart enough to know that she was hitching herself to a very smart man who was poised to make millions of dollars as a bootlegger. Can you talk about their relationship, Um, how they interacted, 
and the kind of things he confided to her. Yeah, they they had um, they were very close in the beginning. Um, Remus didn't trust any women, I don't think, except for Imogene. He called her his prime minister. Um, he involved her in all of his business actions. He let her read paperwork. Um, he consulted her on deals. He sought her advice. He actually considered her a, an equal in that sense. He, he, I guess he sensed that she um, was sort of a savvy player in her own right, and he, he wanted her approval in a, um, to a certain degree. And Imogene um, played this ingenue, although she was, um, you know, at the, the newspapers at the time called her, quote, a middle-aged flapper. <laughs> um, and they have, you know, their whole diatribes against middle-aged flappers. But um, Imogene was uh, in her late 30s when she met George and um, just not too much younger than him, maybe six or seven years. And, and she ended up calling him Daddy. That was That was her nickname for him, Daddy. I know you mentioned that he personally had a temper. But in business, he was a little bit different than his counterparts in, in that he preferred paying people off with money as opposed to automatically striking out in violence against people he wanted to influence. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, Remus was very successful, I think, because he tried to be discreet, as great, discreet as somebody with as large an operation as he had could possibly be. Um, and he was willing to pay... A, thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably into the millions of dollars worth of bribes at all levels of government. Um, at one point, he was partnering with Jess Smith, who was the right-hand man of Attorney General um, Harry Doherty, so, who, and, uh, who really, and also you know, on a par with Warren Harding. Uh, the whole Ohio gang in the White House was very corrupt and all you know, in bed to one extent or another with the bootleggers. Um, and Remus, that was working very well for Remus. And I, I think he was um, sort of too smart in a way to, to messy things up with, with a bunch of murders. One of his smarter moves was setting up shop at this place nicknamed um, Death Valley Farm. Yes. Can you explain how he accrued the farm and the role it served in his operations? Sure. Uh, Death Valley Farm came about because uh, Remus feared whiskey pirates, which was a real problem for bootleggers at the time. And, and pirates, they weren't pirates in the ahoy matey sense. Um, they were basically fellow bootleggers who would, you know, go attack somebody's supply, tie up any watchmen, bound and gag people who were who were guarding the alcohol, um, steal everything and sort of spirit it away and sell it on their own markets. And Remus was attacked by a group of them once and basically fought all of them off. They still managed to steal his whiskey that night, but but he held his own. Um, but after that incident, uh, he consulted with a friend, what his lieutenant, really, George Connors, who becomes a very important character in, in the story, um, to to ask him. He asked him to find a, a secure place. And Death Valley was the answer. It was uh, this little in this little hamlet, not too far from Cincinnati. You had to drive down a long road. Um, it sort of uh, was down a hill. There were a bunch of outhouses, places where you could scatter weapons and, and watchmen. And it was a really well uh, regulated and well guarded sort of encampment. And they named it Death Valley in honor of uh, pi whiskey pirates who who tried to enter and were never heard from again. So every good bad guy needs an adversary. Would you say that Mabel Walker Willebrandt was the force of good in this story? Yeah, I, I she was um, a perfect uh, protagonist and also a great foe for Remus. You know, here, because she was also such an unexpected and strange character in her own right. You know, Mabel Walker Willebrandt was named by Warren Harding, the Assistant Attorney General of the United States, in 1921. Now, women had only had the right to vote in America for nine months at this time. Um, Willebrandt was 32 years old, only five years out of law school, and had never prosecuted a single criminal case. And suddenly, here she was in charge of all prohibition cases all across the country, including cases against Remus. And to make matters even more difficult for her, she was almost wholly deaf and um, used a, an elaborate uh, hairdo to cover up the hearing aids that she had to wear um, before she went to court. And um, I can't even imagine she, her, how she handled her job, the pressures of her job and the sexism she encountered. You know, many people, many men and other people, even women, were, were not happy with the fact that, that, you know, women suddenly had the right to vote. And here was this woman who was now the most powerful, one of the most powerful people in the United States government. And she was incredibly thick skinned. Um, and one of my favorite anecdotes from her childhood that sort of sums up 
how her personality formed. Um, once she bit a pet cat's ear, and to teach her a lesson, her father bit her ear back. <laughs> So one of the things that Willebrand does in focusing on Remus, she needs to dispatch prohibition agents to investigate his operations. How did Remus first register on her radar and what methods did she use to deal with him? That's a good question. Um, I should say that that one of the reasons she was appointed by Warren Harding, you know, as I had mentioned um, that that administration was in bed with a lot of the bootleggers. So they figured, oh, who better to appoint in charge to be in charge of all prohibition cases than this this little lady? She's just out of law school. You know, she probably won't really do anything and, and she won't be a threat to the cozy relationship we have going with all these bootleggers. And of course, the irony being that she gets into office and immediately starts kicking some ass. <laughs> and she, you know, to, to Harry Doherty's credit, he did not impede her work. Um, I, I think he realized to some extent that he had to at least keep up the appearance of, of conducting an office um, that was adhering to the law. Uh, and he, how she first became no, um, aware of Remus's operation from a letter that Doherty put on her desk. Um, and it was from a, uh, an attorney and um, a, federal, a federal prosecutor in Cincinnati who was basically talking about the large scale operation, whiskey operation that was running in his city. And it was so overwhelming. Um, they had never seen anything like it before. And they really needed Washington's help to um, squash this whiskey ring. So that's how George Remus got on her radar. And she immediately set to work um, trying to figure out what was going on there. And one of the agents she dispatched to um, investigate Remus's empire was um, her ace of detectives, as he came to be called, uh, Prohibition Agent Franklin Dodge, which, of course, um, but started a, a, a love triangle that would really um, unravel, unravel the whole situation. What were Franklin Dodge's credentials? Well, his largest credential was that his father was a, a very powerful politician in Michigan who had friends in high places, who was friends with um, Supreme Court justices and, and various other people. Um, and he got Dodge a job, you know, in the in the federal government. And he worked his way up to becoming a, a, a with the Justice Department, an agent with the Justice Department. And Remus was his first major prohibition case. Um, and so uh, I think that Dodge also figured he had a lot to prove um, and and invested himself in, in Remus's life and, and actually stationed himself outside of Remus's mansion in Cincinnati to keep tabs on him day and night. And at one point before this love triangle begins, Remus thinks that he might be able to actually work with Dodge. He is so used to being able to, to pay off whoever he needs to pay off with, with huge amounts of money, he thinks he's invincible. So what happened, uh, Willebrand succeeds in getting Remus put behind bars. Um, she helps the Cincinnati federal prosecutors build a case against him. Um, and Remus finds himself at the uh, federal penitentiary in Atlanta. Um, and at some point, Franklin Dodge ends up there um, because he was uh, sent by Willenbrandt to conduct an investigation of, of the corrupt prison warden who was taking bribes, of course, from Remus and the other bootleggers. And Remus heard from a bootlegger friend that Dodge was amenable to bribes. Um, he would be willing to, you know, have a quid pro quo for a certain exchange of money. Um, and he was interested in trying to get a sentence reduced or, or uh, commuted altogether. And he told Imogene, his wife, his wife, Imogene, who had been visiting him constantly, you know, getting down on her hands and knees to scrub his cell and basically doting on him in prison as she had doted on him back in Cincinnati at their home. Um, he tells Imogene to, quote unquote, cultivate Dodge. Um, and Imogene, uh, <laughs> who was always looking for a new angle, did not have to be asked twice. So Remus had what he thought was an ace in the hole. This guy, Jess Smith. He was a fixer, um, getting paid twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars every time he sat down with Remus, and in exchange, Smith would see to it that Remus never saw the inside of a prison. That's what he told him. So when Remus is targeted and ends up in jail, of course, he's not too happy about it. Right? Yeah. Um, Jeff Smith and, and Remus had a very cozy arrangement going for a while. 
Um, they would meet frequently at hotels um, across the eastern coast and in the Midwest. And uh, as you said, Remus would hand over vast sums of money in exchange for, number one, withdrawal permits um, that would allow Remus to keep withdrawing whiskey from his his various distilleries. Um, and these would be gov- actually government withdrawal permits and not falsified permits. So it's sort of an extra la- layer of protection there. Um, and Smith also did promise protection against the law. Um, he said that there would be no prosecution against Remus. And if against all odds there was a prosecution, um, Remus wouldn't be convicted. And against even further odds, if Remus was convicted, he would never actually go to jail. Smith would be able to get him a pardon from um, Harry Doherty, the, the district, the attorney general. Sorry. Um, and of course, all of these promises fell through and Remus does up, end up in jail, um, much to Remus's um, anger and discontent. And Jess Smith commits suicide. Yes, that's what people think um you know first there was all this uh, rumors and speculation that that smith was actually made to look as if he had uh, committed suicide and he was actually murdered um but all signs really point to uh his committing suicide so now that remus is in jail he has this hot and cold relationship with imogene when she visits they fight a lot they make up a lot but meanwhile he's living in the lap of luxury Yeah, uh, I mean, that was part of the reason that the warden of the Atlanta penitentiary is being um, investigated by Dodge, you know, at Willebrandt's orders. Uh, He was taking bribes from all these bootleggers. And in exchange, Remus and other other men there were living high on the hog. Uh, They Remus and this one bootlegger, Savannah bootlegger named Willie Har, actually had dinner together every night in this um, dining room with complete with tablecloth and flowers and a maid to cook their meals. Um, Remus was able to redecorate his cell. Um, you know, they had a radio. They had, uh, you know, sort of socializing opportunities. They had their own library. Uh, they had cushy jobs within the prison. Um, so, but despite all this, Remus was miserable. Um, he he really desperately wanted to regain his freedom, um, and and so that's where he started thinking about ways he might connect with Franklin Dodge. So when in his mind does he stop believing that Imogene is on his side and realize that she's double-crossing him instead? You know, I think that um, Willie Har, the, the bootlegger I mentioned, the Savannah guy who, who was Remus's best friend in prison, I guess you could say, started warning him. He said, you know, I've been hearing rumors uh, about Imogene. Uh, rumors that she is um, conducting herself in an unbecoming fashion um, and, you know, the delicate language they used back in the 1920s. Uh, And uh, Remus was furious and he basically shot the messenger and attacked Har for saying such a thing. Um, Later they made up. Remus apologized. That that was one thing. Remus always came back with a very uh, gentlemanly apology after he did one of these, had one of his outbursts. And, uh, he apologized, and, and then the evidence sort of became clear to him. When, when, when Imogene filed for divorce, it accelerated um, what, what Remus called his diseased mind. So I want to ask you about this diseased mind thing. What, what is your opinion on that? Do, do you think he was suffering from a, a mental illness, or was it some sort of a physical ailment? You know, it's such a good question, and I, the, the short answer is I don't know. You know, I, th- there's no way to really know exactly what, I, I mean, even the psychiatrist that examined him, you know, didn't come to any one conclusive answer about, about what his mental state was and what, if he was suffering from anything, and if so, what. Um, but I will say this. I think that Remus was absolutely, um, in, the, in the legal definition of the word. I think he was sane, but I also think that he couldn't help himself and that he was, he was, um, eccentric, um, and strange and, um, compulsive, impulsive, um, and, and sort of, like I said, he just couldn't help himself. Uh, so it's kind of, I guess, this delicate balance between, uh, sanity and sat and insanity in, in, in the sense that, he knew right from wrong, um, but he could not, in certain circumstances, um, con- contain himself. It was impossible for him to do so. Um, so <laughs> I am by the, not not in any way, shape, or form a doctor or psychiatrist, so that's my sort of lay opinion. I, I did read a lot about 
you know, what, what was the thinking on insanity at the time and what was the, you know, di- what, what did it mean to different people? And everybody had a different definition of it. And I think even one of the doctors that examined Remus said that if you asked 50 physicians, not one of them will come up with the same answer in terms of what insanity truly means. While Remus is in jail, things turn for the worse for him if they couldn't get worse already. As you mentioned, his fellow inmate begins filling him in on his cheating wife, and then the stories get more and more horrible for him. What exactly is going on? What are Imogene and her new beau, Franklin Dodge, doing behind his back? Well, that's the thing. Remus's fears were all justified. Um, She absolutely was carrying on a torrid affair with a prohibition agent who put Remus in jail. Um, I do have to say, I, I mean, that would infuriate anybody. Um, I think it's safe to say, um, she was plotting with him to steal Remus's money, his possessions, his whiskey certificates. Um, she said things like she would have him sent back to Germany. Um, you know, she threatened him with deportation and she sort of made inroads, um, with the authorities uh, on that front. Um, so Remus fears were absolutely founded. Um, and and he he gathered evidence um, that she was conducting all these various plots against him, um, and including murder. Um, Imogene plotted to murder him. It hadn't done him any good either that just before he'd gone to prison, he'd transferred his assets into her name. <laughs> yeah, you know it, it was um, a sign of his trust in her that he that he did that before he left. He figured. You know, they had this sort of loving conversation, at least in his mind, um, before he went to jail in which they they promised that as soon as he got out, they would retire. They'd go somewhere quiet. They would, quote unquote, live a life of peace. They would tour the jungles of Africa and sort of settle down somewhere out of the public view. And I think Remus truly believed this would happen. And it was something that sustained him when he was in jail and to sort of um, hear what was happening on the outside while he was stuck inside um, without any means to do anything about it um, was really uh, sort of um, contributing to his mental condition and, you know, spinning his own mind in in dangerous ways. And she would accuse him of physical abuse during their relationship as well, right? Yes, she did. And um, to to be fair, his first wife also did. Um, And Remus, of course, did have a violent temper um, and, uh, you know, it's easy to believe that, that there were some physical altercations with his and, and some abuse with his wives. Um, although, of course, his his first wife would come around to defend him in, in a very bizarre way, in my opinion. <laughs> Again, um, as things get stickier and stickier with them, Remus starts learning that Dodge is actually singling him out. Yeah, there was a trial for Sartain, the warden, the corrupt warden at the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Um, Remus, Willie Haar, and a few other bootleggers were moved um, to Atlanta from Athens. They were temporarily housed in Athens, um, and they were moved back to Atlanta in case they had to testify uh, against, you know, against anybody in this trial. And some of the prisoners were allowed out at night into Atlanta, sort of under supervised watch. Um, They had a curfew. They had to be back at a certain time. It's kind of remarkable to think of that today, (laughs) to just tell a bunch of prisoners, oh, go out and have some fun, just be back by nine. Um, and, but Remus was the lone holdout, um, and he asked around and and figured out that it was actually Franklin Dodge who was, um, ordering Remus to stay put inside his hotel room under supervision while all of his colleagues, his bootlegging colleagues were allowed to go around and roam around Atlanta. So, um, that also, of course, heightened his suspicions about what Imogene and Dodge were up to. So how long was he in jail for the first time around? So Remus, um, his sentence was uh, divided into two parts. He was serving two years in Atlanta Penitentiary for violating the uh, Volstead Act. And then he had to serve an additional year in an Ohio County jail um, for uh, uh, operating a nuisance, quote unquote. There was a violation about an operating a nuisance at Death Valley Farm. Um, and it was in this, this last year um, serving the sentence in the Ohio County jail uh, that Remus's, I, I think, mental and physical condition really deteriorated. Uh, George Connors, his friend and lieutenant, was worried about him all the time. Connors actually traveled to Washington, D.C. 
to meet with Mabel Walker Willebrand, begging her to move him to a more um, hospita hospitable facility where he might be treated a bit better and have some light and a chance to exercise. Uh, and Willebrand for once took mercy on him. Um, but it's fair to say at this time, uh, there were several incidents of brainstorms, um, which was at the time a euphemism for um, uh, sort of an insanity, uh, these little sort of seizures or um, incidents uh, that exhibited were signs of insanity, according to the medical thinking of the time. And, and Remus was suffering brainstorms um, on a fairly consistent basis and alarming everybody who, who came into contact with him at that time. There are so many instances in the book where he is just so devastated by her actions. Um, one of the worst for him is when he goes back to the house and, and finds all of the furniture gone. And even worse, a few things left behind that were meant to taunt him. Oh, absolutely. Um, it was one of my favorite scenes to write, actually, when he discovers um, how she and Franklin Dodge had ransacked the house. Um, and there was various testimony about how Imogene had done things like um, change the lettering, the, the, inscript, the etched um, monogram on one of the cars had previously been um, GR for George Remus. Um, and that she had changed that to read FD for Franklin Dodge. And she also did the same for a set of China um, that was that, that they had purchased together. Um, so just these sort of um, also leaving a bunch of um, men's clothing that was not Remus's size uh, and things like that, just to, to taunt Remus, as you said, and, and um, which further, you know, sparked his his brainstorms and his dangerous thinking when it came to imaging. And Dodge gets fired, right? Uh, Dodge is eventually fired, um, but I don't think that really bothers him too much. You know, Dodge was one of those guys that that sort of failed upward, um, <laughs> and he went right from um, being a the ace prohibition agent to uh, you know cavorting around with bootleggers and stealing Remus's money. And and uh, you know, in the end, he doesn't really have any great. Uh, he doesn't really pay for what he did, in my in my view. So kind of the last straw for Remus is the divorce. She demands a divorce, but he still keeps trying to hold out. He obviously loved, loved her tremendously and hoped against hope that she might come back to him. But once the divorce is asked for, he completely falls apart. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely think that he held out hope. Um, there were several instances where he offered um, to try to reconcile. Um, he and, and sometimes he wanted to reconcile under the guise of a settlement. Um, he would lure Imogene over and say, you know, let's let's work this out amicably. I will offer you a settlement so we can don't have to have this messy divorce and hurt each other. Um, but while he was offering these settlements, he really his secret hope was that they were going to reconcile. Um, and, you know, there was actually kind of heartbreaking, even knowing what a what a bad guy Remus could be, you know, he would buy her flowers and candy and, and sort of um, his friends talked about how he beamed and he was smiling and very happy whenever he thought that he had the chance to reconcile with Imogene. Um, and he definitely had that hope for, for quite some time after her betrayal. So everything culminates on the first day of the divorce proceedings. Would you mind walking us through what he does when he spies her on that sidewalk? Um, well, I'd just like to say that he he spies her um, and he he thought that he was going to catch Imogene with Franklin Dodge. Um, but he sees Imogene with her daughter, Ruth, whom Remus had actually adopted um, back when he and Imogene first got married. And he said the sight of her smile infuriated him. Um, he there was a car chase and he starts uh, pursuing her through Eden Park in Cincinnati. And he also still at this time was worried that she was going to kill him. He had just received a visit the day before from the man who says that Imogene had hired him. Um, so they have a showdown in Eden Park. And things don't go well for her. He ends up shooting her in the stomach. She doesn't live long. The details on how the murder went down um, are in the book. For all appearances, it looks as though he has murdered her. And many will argue that this is the case. But he doesn't see it that way. And, and he doesn't try to escape. He immediately turns himself in. Uh, that's true. He, um, he feels justified in what he did. Uh, he sort of proudly proclaims it at the police station. 
in rather horrifying language. Um, you know, if any, uh, I'll, I'll let people who want to read the book, you know, see exactly what he says. Um, but it was quite horrifying. And it was really, you know, history's most common defense. This was, quote unquote, an immoral woman, and she deserved to be removed for the betterment of society. Um, so it just sort of um, was something that, that he carried around with himself as a, as a bit of a badge of honor in the beginning. The trial is pretty amazing. One of the things he had despaired about when he had gone to prison is that he'd lost his law license, which was really important to him. But suddenly he has the chance to become an attorney again, his own attorney this time, and he is on cloud nine about it. (laughs) He's found a new reason to live. Yeah, I think that he, um, once he realized that he could defend himself and he sort of tricks, he was such a brilliant man. I mean, for how crazy and awful he was, he was also just undeniably brilliant and sort of runs all roughshod all over the prosecution. He just outsmarts them in every step. Um, And as soon as he is uh, allowed, he gets the judge to allow him to start questioning his own potential jury members. Um, They have to just let him continue on in the capacity as his own defense attorney. Um, And he just sort of anticipates every move they're going to make and, uh, you know, and, and just really... In a, in a very um, disturbing, um, perverse way, has a lot of fun with it. So what is his defense? How does he argue that he should not be found guilty for this? Well, uh, his defense was, uh, quote unquote, transitory insanity, which was a, a term at the time for, for temporary insanity. Um, and he, he claimed that he was not well at the moment, um, when he committed the crime, but was, you know, as soon as the crime was committed, he was immediately cured and he stands before you now a sane and (laughs) perfectly normal man. And I think that, that, you know, the important thing about one of the important things about the trial is that Remus wasn't the only one on trial. Prohibition was on trial. Um, there were a lot of people in Cincinnati who had lost their jobs because of prohibition, uh, you know, brewer, brewers, bartenders, glass makers, bottle makers, barrel makers, um, um, all sorts of people who were employed in, in the alcohol industry lost their jobs. And Remus was sort of a folk hero. He employed about 3,500 people in Cincinnati during his his heyday. And they did not think that Remus should have gone to jail in the first place. Um, so it was sort of, you're, they were starting the trial from that standpoint. You know, here's a guy who was already convicted of a stupid crime. And now here is a crime that was born out of the first crime. And, uh, you know, it's, that was the lens through which a lot of people viewed that trial. And you write that part of the problem for the prosecution was Imogene's flapper lifestyle. Yeah, that's the other thing. Um, you know, as I was talking about in the beginning, people were not thrilled with the idea that their mothers and their wives and their girlfriends and their sisters and their daughters suddenly had the right to vote. And then they were suddenly in the workplace and they were suddenly wearing shorter skirts and were flouting conventional uh, societal norms and were um, smoking and, and sort of and dancing and being brazen. Um, and, and they didn't like this. And uh, it was a way that, that women's rights were also on trial. Um, Imogene sort of symbolized a woman who dared to do what she wanted to do, be as, as sort of brazen and as terrible as a man would be. And she dared to think that she could get away with it. And there were a lot of people who did not want her to get away with it. In a lot of this book, he's slowly steaming and festering over Franklin Dodge, even using this uh, very colorful expression, smash him? <laughs> There were a couple of things. One of his favorite phrases was, I want to crack a skull. I think he said that quite often. I want to crack a skull. Right. Does he ever get a chance to confront Franklin Dodge? Uh, He does not. Uh, Well, not at the end. Not after everything happened. But there are various instances where the two of them um, are are, uh, come into contact with each other. Um, And there is a a sort of people standing right there on guard to try to prevent any sort of uh, physical altercation. But but the the two do have a few run-ins. One of the other interesting aspects of the trial, among many, is that the prosecutor was the son of a former president of the United States. Yes. uh, Charlie Taft was the son of William Howard Taft. Um, he was uh, became a beloved figure in Cincinnati, but he was still sort of um, a novice as, a, as the city's prosecutor um, when he took on the Remus trial. Uh, and I think that he 
uh, became aware very quickly of what he was up against. Um, and Remus, it should be noted, had a reputation in the courtroom as being very erratic, uh, weeping, pulling out his hair, jumping around, c- occasionally attacking opposing counsel physically. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that Taft really did not know how to handle him. And Remus took advantage of that, too. So with all of these antics, this defense of his, which wasn't bought by everyone, but bought by the jury, he was ultimately found not guilty. What do you think is the reason for his acquittal? Oh, I think that um, it sort of goes back to uh, the idea of prohibition being on trial. Um, That's what a lot of people had said at the end. You know, um, he had already unjustly spent years in, in various jail cells. Um, and, you know, he had already gone through so much. And, and not only was he behind bars for these uh, these um, offenses that really shouldn't have warranted jail time, in their view, uh, he was also dealing with a woman who was, um, you know, behind it, going behind his back. Uh, and, um, you know, Remus had actually said before the trial began that he wanted a jury of all women, and um, which was sort of a surprising statement. And then he clarified it by saying, you know, there's no harsher judge um, than a woman, than a woman, uh, you know, standing b- in judgment before a woman who has betrayed her mate. Um, you know, women are sort of their own harshest critics when it comes to to betrayal. Um, so, so that was his thinking, and it ended up being, I guess, a, a very prescient um, way to to view what was going to happen. What happened to him after the trial? Um, Remus. Uh, <laughs> sort of went about trying to regain his fortune. Um, you know, if Imogene succeeded at anything, it was it was that she managed to bankrupt him. Um, his money was never really recovered. Uh, if it was, it wasn't nearly to the extent of what, what he had once had. You know, he had a pittance compared to his, his previous fortune. Um, and he sort of lived out the rest of his days quietly and in, in obscurity. Is there a moral to all of this? You know, I, if the book is asking any big questions, um, I, I'd like to think, you know, what is the value of a human life? How, how, and, and sort of the capacity to deceive. Uh, everybody in this book is capable in some degree of deception. Uh, Willebrandt is deceives, Dodge deceives, Remus deceives, Imogene deceives, and they deceive others. They deceive themselves. And, and it's sort of just a question about, um, to, to what extent can we do that and, and expect to get away with it? And if we do get away with it, how, how does it haunt us? And, and do we ever truly get away with it if, it's, if it stays with us on some level? Um, so that, that's sort of what was running through my mind when, when I was um, detailing and writing and researching about these various plots um, that, were, that were percolating throughout the story. So you've got a really wonderful website where people can find more information about the book and see photographs since there aren't any in the book. Great. Do you have a galley or do you just have, do you have an actual book? Oh, I'm not sure. I guess it must be a, a galley copy. Yeah, there's three photographs in the book. I, I didn't want to overwhelm people with photos. Um, it was one of those stories that I thought was so, uh, the amount of detail that I was able to get and the descriptions I was able to find in, in the historical record were so vast and I thought, wonderful that I didn't want to, you know, I wanted people's imaginations to sort of take off on their own and not be beholden to the pictures that, of, um, to the factual record in the pictures. Um, and sometimes people are so much more disappointing looking in, in, in real life than they are in your head. So I just wanted, I just wanted to, to let people have their imagination in terms of the characters in the Ghost of Eden Park. But if people do want to check out the photos, get more information on the characters, they can go to your website and see them, read about them, and learn about all of your other books as well. Yeah, there is a section, um, a little historical section for each of the books where you can uh, learn more about the characters and sort of their backgrounds and, and anything else that was interesting and relevant during the time period. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a lot of fun with that, um, just sort of trying to create a world, um, trying to create a world on, on the website where people might, you know, find reason to to get lost uh, in the story. Oh, one more quick question. The way you described the opulence of the Remus mansion, it sounded so incredible. Is the mansion still standing? Oh, God, I wish it did. Um, Like every other great house in history, or many great houses in history, including the Everly's brothel in Chicago, um, it has been raised to the ground uh, in its place now is is um, another uh, a subdivision, I believe. There's there's another structure there. Um, I drove past it when I was in Cincinnati, 
Um, but but Remus's mansion, sadly, is is no longer with us. The description of the house in your book it it, it must have just been stunning, and and the swimming pool especially. Yeah, um, and I love the story of the swimming pool. You know, at Remus, um, as I mentioned, was a competitive swimmer. It had been his dream as uh, since he was a young boy to own his own pool. So it was sort of this wish fulfillment for him. And of course, um, being as in love with Imogene as he was, he dedicated the pool to her. He called it the Imogene Baths. Um, and during their fantastic party, uh, he had hired synchronized swimmers and water nymphs and various other people to perform uh, routines in the pool. Um, there were uh, needle baths and, and various kinds of baths, um, electric baths, which were the sort of early version of a tanning bed. It was heated by incandescent lights and said to make the user, quote unquote, frisky. Um, <laughs> he had, uh, you know, people walking around with delicacies and all kinds of alcohol that he himself wouldn't taste. Um, there was a band there. Everybody um, stood on the diving board and, and gave toasts to the new year. Remus um, dove into the into the water wearing his tuxedo. Um, it was sort of this grand evening, but for Remus, a sad evening also because uh, nobody from Cincinnati society and accepted his invitation, and he ends up spending the rest of the most of the night alone in his room reading a biography of Abraham Lincoln. And I remember this vividly. He was eating cold boiled ham and ice cream. Yes. Cold, boi- cold boiled ham was his favorite post-swim snack. And, um, and uh, of course, I guess you want a bowl of ice cream to wash that down. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Eric. It's great to talk with you. Again, I've been speaking to Karen Abbott. Her book is called The Ghosts of Eden Park. This has been another episode of The Most Notorious Podcast broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.